Thank you very much, Tansri. I'm happy to be here amongst uh, such a distinguished list of speakers. And congratulations on the inauguration of the Jeffrey Chow Institute on Southeast Asia. I'm slightly concerned at having to speak immediately after lunch because I'm still digesting my lunch and uh, some of you will be sleepy. Um, nonetheless, in my presentation, I'm going to focus more on the domestic fault lines uh, using Malaysia as a case study. I think Professor James Chin is, will talk more about the region and Professor Yoon about the international fault lines. Now, in the Malaysian case, when we talk about fault lines, we have a large number to choose from. The Malaysian demographic can be said to have fault lines in terms of politics, ethnicity, language, religion, culture, socioeconomic status, educational background, and intellectual outlook. Divisions can arise from different expectations of the role of the state, different worldviews on any matter of public policy, or the environment, or even what it means to be a good citizen. And let's not forget the generation gap too. In several countries, there are also fault lines that have implications on territorial integrity, bringing the analogy, bringing the analogy from geography into stark reality. But most of these fault lines are present to some extent in probably every country throughout the region, though perhaps some cleavages are greater in some countries than others. Let's take socioeconomic status as an example. Income inequality in Malaysia, as measured by the Gini coefficient, is the worst in the region, and differences are stark even within Malaysia, particularly between Peninsula and East Malaysia. Given what was said yesterday about the resource curse, I would also like to point out that it's Sabah and Sarawak that are richest in natural resources, but also have the poorest communities. But it is politics that provides the most prominent fissures in our democratic, uh, demographic terrain. Anyone who spends some time in Malaysia will quickly realize how deeply politicized everything becomes. And it is often driven by the other fault lines that crisscross the main fault lines of politics. Every area of public policy, whether education, transport, or health, is politicized not only for the sake of usual party politics you see in other democracies, but are agitated further by those who deliberately exploit the existence of fault lines to further their own interests. And there's a very diverse group of stakeholders. You have rent seekers who use racially motivated uh, language uh, to uh, you know, enrich themselves. You have activists who try to monopolize control over what happens in schools. Um, and even, even extraordinary events like the search for the missing Malaysia Airlines plane is politicized. Now, is there something about Malaysia that makes it particularly prone to fault lines? The ethnic dimension is often touted as a reason why Malaysia is special. And indeed, we all recognize that this country has had ethnic diversity right from its inception. But I want to ask, was ethnic diversity always a fault line? Or at least, was it always a fault line to the extent that it is now? Has what was originally a hairline crack become a fault line? And was the what was the role of government policy in all this? Was it government policy that, that expanded the fissure in the first place? Or did the gap grow despite government policy? And this is an important question, because if we accept that government policy has a hand in the creation of fault lines, then we must equally accept that government policy has a hand in the sealing of those fault lines. Perhaps even in those cases where fault lines predate a nation, we nonetheless expect government to address them. And this brings us to the next question. In whose interests is it to manage these fault lines? Hold that thought. If you study plate tectonics, you know that different parts of the Earth's crust can either move towards each other, move away from each other, or slide along each other. Plates move because there are underlying forces that push or pull them in different directions. When it comes to fault lines in society, however, the analogy breaks down because there are many different configurations of plates operating at the same time, overlapping one on top of another. Take the forces that uh, shape the education landscape in Malaysia, for example. Government policy itself is heavily influenced by the legacy of ethnically defined party politics with its great historical momentum, but also by more recent calls for reform that invoke the vocabulary of school-based assessments, PISA rankings, parental autonomy, decentralization, and trust schools. Another underlying force 
that moves the educational plates is the choices of parents themselves, which push and pull on the structures of government, as well as sustain the very active competition that exists in the private sector. But those actions are determined by their socioeconomic position and their cultural background. And one of the things that my think tank, the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs, is working on is how to ensure that the Malaysian education system responds more effectively to what Malaysian parents want. One of the criticisms of this is that it might lead to even more chaos. In other words, our detractors accuse us of wanting to deepen the fault lines even more. But I want to reiterate my earlier question. Does diversity in a society necessarily lead to fault lines? I would posit that diversity need not be seen as fault lines if a society nonetheless possesses a strong shared sense of history, of opportunity, and of destiny. As I have often written in my column, the education system is a key shaper of this, but so are strong national institutions that enjoy the confidence of the public. Citizens can only feel that they equally belong to a nation when they know that bodies such as the police, the elections commission, and the judiciary operate according to their constitutional remit. And so creating this, sense, this shared sense of citizenship is one of the biggest challenges of a country like Malaysia today. The people in power are fully aware of the existence of many fault lines, but don't seem sure how to respond to them. As I mentioned earlier, some politicians depend on exploiting these fault lines in order to stay in power. The most obvious illustration of this is the deliberate calls to protect a single ethnic or religious identity, even if it is at the expense of another. And so what you get is a mishmash of policies, some that overtly call on citizens to rise up above the fault lines through formulations like One Malaysia or Bangsa Malaysia, and other policies that continue to pay homage to divisions in society because it is expedient for political purposes. And this contradiction itself creates a fault line because amongst those who might support the same politician or the same party, but for completely different reasons. But when the formulations that call for greater unity coexist amongst policies that result in greater disunity, the contradiction can be too much to bear and they will be derided as being hypocritical or hollow. So managing fault lines is no easy business. Even if you have a government that genuinely wishes to reduce the fault lines, pre-existing forces mean that you can't simply paper over the cracks. You need to understand and grapple with the underlying forces first. Of course, if you're a government that doesn't want to genuinely reduce the fault lines, but merely hopes to stay in power by managing targeted elites, then the prospects are much more terrifying for we only have the appearance of managing sources of tension or worse, deliberate mismanagement. So it's essential that the powers outside government contribute to the management of fault lines. And this is where the role of civil society is crucial. In Malaysia over the last 10 years, there has been quite a growth in civil society space. And we in ideas were lucky to ride this wave of greater democratization. However, some of the fault lines have also made their way into this space, which is why we often have robust debates with other think tanks who don't necessarily share our enthusiasm for Tunku Abdul Rahman and the Merdeka spirit. But I believe that this dialogue, which is often absent in traditional politics, is essential. Communication across fault lines is the first step to building bridges across them. If there is no communication or if growing fault lines are ignored, there may come a time when the rupture is so large as to cause an earthquake, to continue the analogy. Perhaps in this category are calls for greater autonomy in some parts of the country. If these demands are not met, then perhaps one day those calls for autonomy may lead to calls for secession or separation. Again, it is not easy to address these in the political arena. Too many political forces continue to depend on and indeed deliberately expand fault lines in order to keep themselves in power. Entire political movements, even parties, can be predicated upon the existence of these fault lines. And if we are not careful, some of these domestic fault lines can spill over into the international arena as well. Take aggressive nationalism, for example. When two neighboring countries have a spat about ownership about cert of certain islands or even art forms, you will inevitably see a minority in both countries calling for diplomatic sanctions or even war against the other country. You will recall the uh, dancers and Rasa Sayang spats that Malaysia has had with Indonesia. 
Um, and if you let these minorities grow, you will have a real problem in your hands. The fault lines of domestic politics will inevitably become a major determinant of foreign policy. And that is why it is in the interest of regionalism and of ASEAN in particular that national leaders take greater steps to manage domestic fault lines. If they don't, I worry that the lofty projects of ASEAN, in particular the three pillars of the ASEAN community, will not progress beyond being driven by elites for the benefit of elites. For it will be nigh impossible to engender a genuinely pluralistic mass affinity towards ASEAN when there continue to be so many sources of division and tension within individual countries. The alternative, it might be argued, might be to empower ASEAN institutions like the Secretariat or the position of Secretary General itself by injecting democracy into those institutions, a bit like what has happened in the European Union. But looking at their record, I do not think the European president is very helpful for us. And besides, notions of national sovereignty are still strongly held here, rightly so in my opinion. So what can we do here in Malaysia? As I have made clear, the fault lines that are cracking our country apart must be addressed and managed. And as I implied earlier, I do believe that there are those throughout government and bureaucracy that realize this and are taking steps. The formation of the National Unity Consultative Council is a recent manifestation of this. But as I also pointed out, there are many competing forces at work. It will not be easy to calm the fault lines because too many people have too much to gain by ensuring that they persist. The emergence of civil society has helped moderate the debate, but whether or not they succeed can only truly be tested in the political arena at subsequent general elections. As I mentioned at the outset, Politics provides the biggest fault line in this country, and it will be through the political process that fault lines can begin to close. To conclude, diversity need not result in fault lines. The motto on the Malaysian coat of arms proclaims unity as strength, and ASEAN itself acknowledges the huge diversity within the grouping. Citizens, whether of, As of Malaysia or other countries in the region, will always possess different traits and beliefs from one another. Still, it is possible to subscribe to powerful shared values, while our differences can and must be recast as opportunities to know each other, to mutually benefit from each other, and to strengthen each other. If we succeed in doing so, then we will do much more than merely manage our fault lines, but provide immunity from future ones as well. Thank you very much.